nanohub.org. You can follow along with this presentation using printed slides from the NanoHub. Visit www.nanohub.org and download the PDF file containing the slides for this presentation. Print them out and turn each page when you hear the following sound. Enjoy the show. So in this lecture I'm going to try to explain intuit with intuitive arguments what this uh, recursive green function algorithm is and how to solve the negative equations rapidly and give you insight what the steps are and relate that to physical insight. I'm assuming that you've seen and got to love those typical negative equations. Um, in negative you have two major components to understand transport. One has to do with the dynamics, with the states of the system, meaning where are the states, just like in optics what are the states and the propagation constants in optics. You solve a wave equation in a sense with green functions for example. In electron transport you have to do one more. You've got to do the bean counting, meaning electron hopping in, electron hopping out. What does it do to the potential and the charge distribution? Okay, so now you have to control that charge flow. So you have to deal with the occupation of the states, not only the existence of the states. Because photons, you can stick in as many as you want into a state, right? But electrons are fermions, they're not bosons. So you gotta keep track of them. Also, they carry charge, whereas photons don't carry charge. So they interact via charge. All right, so the typical equation you need to solve is some Hamiltonian, E minus H, with boundary conditions that couple you to the contacts and some scattering self energies. And so GR is sort of the impulse response. The boundary conditions deal with typically scattering in from the left and scattering in from the right. These are the scattering uh, self energies. And then sigma R deals with the outscattering into other, other channels. And that is proportional to the uh, states themselves. But that gives you sort of how you could scatter out. It doesn't give you the population of the states that will scatter out and will scatter in. That is the second set of equations. That deals with this so-called G less than or GN, where you compute due to source terms the boundary conditions inject carriers, and the scattering from other channels might inject carriers. And those are the sources and they get propagated into the system and that result in charge. And then the boundary self energies look like this. There's coupling to the left times occupation on the left and coupling on the right times occupation of the right. And then there's scattering self energies that depend again on the filling of the states themselves. So scattering makes this whole thing very complicated. And typically what you do is, as a first cut, you assume that there is no scattering. Okay, so you leave out all these scattering self energies and you deal with a coherent system. Okay, so let's do that first. So if you deal with a coherent system, what you might want to do is consider a device like this. A resonant tunneling diode, what a surprise. So here is your electrostatic potential and the conduction bandage of the emitter, a double barrier, and then the contact. And what you want to compute is, uh, number one, you need to compute the open boundary conditions on the left and the far right. And then you want to say, I'm going to treat the whole emitter as a reservoir and the whole collector as a reservoir and I don't want to compute non-equilibrium green functions in these reservoirs. I just want to compute the density of states. But I want to treat the whole reservoir as a contact to the central device. That means I have to calculate scattering energies, in-scattering self-energies and out-scattering self-energies at these interfaces that are shown with the dashed lines. 
So the intuitive answer of what you do is, you start out from a boundary condition from flat bands that you can compute, and you migrate it in numerically up to this point here in the emitter, and you do the same from the right contact. So you treat the whole device explicitly, quantum mechanically, but you do only the carrier dynamics, the occupation of states in Negev, only in the central device. So that's a priori your, your process. So what you want to do is, you have some flat band boundary conditions that sit way out here, and you want to obtain a scattering self energy at this site here. And an in scattering is then just determined by that scattering matrix times the occupation on the left. Same on the right, you want to obtain a self energy that couples you from, from n to n minus 1, and you can compute that from a right connected green function here, and the scattering self energy that occupies these states, that injects these states from the right, are derived from this real self energy times the occupation on the right. So then you end up with a Hamiltonian that you need to do non-equilibrium green functions for that is just defined on the central device nodes, where now the central device nodes have these boundary self-energies on them. And you solve for this, and then you solve for the G less than. So how do you do that? So let's assume you have a, a long device, and you have a tridiagonal Hamiltonian like this. That corresponds to this RTD, right? We discretize this whole RTD. So let's overlay that tridiagonal matrix on top of this RTD, like this. Okay, so we have our potential profile electrostatics, and it's buried in all of these matrix elements here. Right, so you have the diagonal matrix elements and the off-diagonal matrix elements. And this is a sketch, meaning there's about 100 nanometers or more here in the emitter. So that's like 400 numerical sites. Then you have about 5 nanometer barriers, 5 nanometer well, and another 5 nanometer barrier. That's again some 20 plus 20, some 20 sites, 60 sites. And then on the right you have again 100 nanometers ballpark, that's 400 sites. That means in terms of computational load, the contacts are far larger than the central region. Okay. That is also the driver for us to say, if we want to do non-equilibrium green functions in true non-equilibrium, and we can treat these long regions in equilibrium, let's do that. If we know intuitively they are in equilibrium, yet lose that, use that information. And we treat only the device region that is truly out of equilibrium to be out of equilibrium. All right. So let's assume that you have about 400 plus 400 plus uh, you know 60 sites. Let's call that under friends a thousand, right? 500 to a thousand sites. And let's assume you wanted to do this in a multi-band calculation, where instead of these sites being a one by one matrix for effective mass, but they were a 10 by 10 matrix. Your matrix would suddenly be pretty large, right? Even the sparse matrix would be of the order of 500 to, by 500 to a 10,000 by 10,000, depending on your choice of basis and how many nodes you have on the device. So suddenly this device would be run rather large. So in MATLAB, you can calculate inverses of matrices, right? It's very easy. You define a matrix, you type Ike of matrix, or Ike S if you want to have a sparse matrix. But what it will do is well, it will calculate the eigenvalues of the whole thing, or the inverse, if you wanted to have the inverse of that matrix, right? In G, in the green function, we, we would need the inverse because we want to solve the green functions. But is it really true that we need the full inverse? And the answer is no. 
we don't need the inverse of this whole full matrix.